we take a ticket to the wild to see the natural world of British Rail. Britain's railways have an intriguing natural history. They've not only revolutionised our way of life, but plants and animals have found a place to live along the nationwide network of lines. For over a century and a half, they've enjoyed a peculiar privacy in those cross-country corridors along which we anxiously commute. A day return or a season buys not just the privilege of getting there, but on the way, where speed allows, glimpses of a wilderness close to the track that is a legacy from a bygone age. Every ticket takes you to the wild. Cocooned within carriages, double glazed from the world, travellers on the Intercity Express are understandably unaware of the special wilderness just outside that for a moment drowns in the thunder of their passing. Over the years, a museum of assorted trains has inhabited the permanent way but it's because of them the private trackside land exists and has become a thriving botanical garden. Elsewhere, the meadow clary and the knapweed broom rape are both rare, but the railway verge has offered sanctuary to such plants by virtue of its dangers. Here, people should never intrude. These anthills tremble only to the bounce and draught of passing trains that waft in seeds that root in the fine tilth. They become a tangle of grasses through which bank foals burrow, running the gauntlet of hovering kestrels. It's a daily wildlife drama, not easily seen by intercity man. Only if the train makes an unscheduled stop might we wake to find this blur stilled and its hidden surprises revealed. At speed, our eyes drawn to the plainer farmed landscape. At times, a monotony of single crops. And there's not just a fence separating this rich and diverse railway growth from the new and chemically pampered prairies. There's 150 years of countryside change. In a sense, the railway is a remnant of early 19th century Britain, and the train a time machine speeding along a narrow strip of an earlier pastoral landscape. The concept of a railway wasn't new, certainly the Greeks had a word for it. But the needs of the world's first industrial nation put that ancient idea to work, producing a revolution in transport. 18th century elegance gave way to the heroic age of the railway civil engineers. They harnessed their new iron horse and set out with daring and brilliance to lay our railways across mountains, valleys, forests and the most treacherous of marshes. At less than intercity speed, there was time to enjoy the view. 
both of the new architecture and of the landscape. The desire for maximum speed meant keeping curves and gradients to a minimum, and engineers such as Brunel and the Stevensons became legends for their massive earthworks, cuttings, embankments and tunnels. Under these fields at Box near Bath, 4,000 men and 300 horses toiled for two and a half years. A ton of candles was burnt each week. As each new line was built, so a little more of the countryside became fenced in. People were kept out. Only from the boundaries could they enjoy their new passion for trains. A passion that was to grow with the proliferation of lines and the evolution of the great iron horses. In less than a hundred years, it became possible to travel 23 and a half thousand miles by train. The railway companies had put a substantial slice of Britain between their fences. Condensed into one area, it would be comparable in size to a present-day national park such as Dartmoor, but embracing a greater diversity of landscapes. A train might be seen in almost every vista. As Sir John Betjeman once remarked, the railways were built with the idea that they would make the countryside more beautiful. Over 200 companies competed in selling the view of nature's wonders as well as the pleasures of an exciting destination swiftly approached in a style appropriate to this golden age of the train. Of course, the railways weren't built on sea or lakeside routes just for the view. Running on the flattest land was more economical. But what was happening to the land inside the railway fence? The private cuttings and embankments, from which, for reasons of safety, the general public was excluded. Company bylaws threatened a substantial fine for trespass. It's a privacy equally strictly guarded today. There's a clear difference in the land either side of the fence. It reflects the way that farming has impoverished the countryside of wild plants and animals, while the railway has become a refuge for them. The verge is rich in wild flowers, nearly 2,000 different kinds of plant. Weeds to some gardeners and farmers, but here not out of place in a scheme that's been managed over the years by the men of the railways. In search of light, the creeping sink foil reaches out from the verge onto the hot sunny stones or ballast of the track. It's a habit that doesn't endear it to the maintainers of the line. Even tree seedlings attempt to grow in this forbidding desert. And there are creatures here as well, usually on the track of each other. Unlike a busy road, it's safe here for the leisurely slow worm to pursue a meal. 
Between trains, there's little to ruffle this wild community. A green woodpecker knows nothing of Stevenson or Brunel, but recognises that this place is engineered to its needs. In the heyday of the railway, keeping the endless fence in repair was an equally endless task for the unsung heroes of the line. The plate layers, or length men, in their hands lay the future of all that lived beside the track. What lived on the track, in the ash ballast, got short shrift. The rule, then as now, was no plants on the line, because they can block the drainage. Usually between four and seven length men made up a track gang. To them fell the task of reducing the risk of grass fires, often started by sparks from the engines. Once or twice a year they went to work with their scythes. A tough job, hampered by stones and discarded ironmongery. Scything prevented grass seed getting onto the track ballast, as well as lowering the fire risk. But quite incidentally, a century or so of such treatment made these slopes high quality grassland, hay meadows rich in wildflowers. There was lively competition between rival track gangs with coveted annual awards for the best kept length. The prizes were for keeping the railway in good order, but the length men also achieved the accidental creation of a valuable nature reserve. On some lines, at times, the slopes were deliberately burnt to remove dead grass and leaves. Controlled burning was particularly good for preventing the growth of bushes and brambles. Looking back at railway cuttings and embankments of the steam age, the effects of all this hard work are clear. These are not the brambly slopes of today. There'd not be much risk of fire here. There are no trees. They could be a danger in cuttings. They can fall on the line. This looks like a simple lawn, but there's a diversity of wild plants here. Keeping the grass short allows them to flourish. Embankments too got the same neat barbering. Keeping the driver's line of sight clear was essential work for legions of length men. But since 1929, experiments had been underway with chemical control of the weeds on the line. By 1938, the weed-killing train had made its debut, spraying a solution containing sodium chlorate. For safety, the ballasted track and the adjacent cess, as it's known, have to drain freely, so plants can't be allowed to grow there. In these early experimental days, the spray was difficult to control and moving slowly, the train couldn't cover the whole network. On most tracks, the length men were still at work with their hand hose. Techniques have improved, but two annual plants are still able to evade the spray. Spring whitlow grass blossoms by April and sets seed before the spray train passes in late May. The seeds are not affected even by modern weed killers but lie dormant until the next February. And only this late flowering variety of the least toad flax now survives here. 
its seeds germinate and grow after the spray train has passed. Today, the use of weed killing trains is essential, but it's carefully controlled. The chemicals used don't persist in the ground. They're sprayed from low level nozzles that can be adjusted to spray just the track and cess or a strip of vegetation up to three meters wide beside the track. The Nature Conservancy Council has asked that this shouldn't be done where it's not necessary, as for example on grasslands where there are no hazards, but only where lineside bushes need to be controlled for safety. Alternative methods to spraying this narrow strip are being considered. This flail cutter could be an answer to clearing the woody scrub that can obscure the sight lines and scatter branches and leaves on the lines. The death of plants close to the line, such as a spotted orchid, is surely regrettable, regarded by some as a disaster. It places even more importance on the vast acreage of railway land beyond the sprayed area. Here, flowers enjoy an exclusive private life in a very public view. Plants and animals so often take over what we build. And if this drainage channel is good enough for newts, it'll suit those that like newts. The grass snake doesn't follow. It's a long pond and full of other opportunities. The railways snake through a variety of countrysides. These fences enclose their own portion of the North Yorkshire moors. This was land not easily tamed, particularly the quaking bogs, some of which were crossed by supporting the low embankments on sheep hurdles, rolled up fleeces, and whole trees sunk in the peat to form a raft. On a long journey south, you might fall asleep with bog cotton rolling by and wake in the midst of what's left of Britain's dry southern heathlands. Beyond the fence, there's heavily grazed heath, but this untrampled slope is clad in tall heathers and grasses. It's the home of two of the rarest creatures in the country, this sand lizard and the smooth snake. To the men who built the railways, it was just another place to push the line through. But it could one day be all that remains of this unique plant and animal community. The navvies, as they were called, took their name from the navigators who built the canals before them. Photographer Sidney Newton has left us this record of how they worked, how they cut their way through the countryside following the paths charted by the Stevensons, Brunel and other engineers. A cutting began as a gullet opened up by hand. The slopes were carefully shaped, they had to be stable, they'd be here a long time. A railway is only built once, it can't be remade like a road. Stone drainage channels were let into the slope. Turf, dug from the intended path of the cutting, was then laid on the slopes to fix them against the weather. Turf that was often full of wild flowers. Sometimes soil from the top of the cutting was used and sown with rye grass and clover to stabilize the slope. More significantly, seed from the great variety of plants that at that time still grew outside the fence blew onto the cutting 
these chalk slopes were soon to acquire a new cloak of chalk-loving plants. Today we rush in irreverent haste through these gigantic gullies hewn by that vanished army of labourers. The broad green swords are their bequest to us, the gigantic walled cuttings, their mossy monuments. To cut this great trench at Road in Northamptonshire, 300,000 pounds of gunpowder were used to help remove a million cubic yards of clay and flint-hard limestone. Road cutting stands as one of the greatest engineering feats in Britain. In summer, oxide daisies mass on the slopes, a floral tribute visible even from a speeding train. To keep the line level beyond a cutting like this, it must sometimes run along an embankment, a ridge built of soil, perhaps left over from the cutting, or brought in and of quite different type, a ridge with its own bushes and flowers on its slopes. Equally prodigious feats of engineering gave us these raised and solid ramparts. Sometimes, to get enough earth, entire hills were bought and carted to the site. Or the earth required was dug from nearby, leaving large holes known as borrow pits that often became reedy, tranquil pools. What grows on these slopes today reflects the nature of this mongrel earth, a mix of topsoil and ballast tainted by oily wastes and perhaps the residues of weed killer. The once well-trimmed turf is now often shrouded in bushes and trees. They stabilise the slope and are good cover for birds. The dried, discarded ballast at the top supports plants appropriate to a shingle beach. The footings, by contrast, are damp. Here, even from an intercity seat, meadowsweet can be seen standing out brightly. Some footings and borrow pits, reeds give house room to reed warblers, seasonal guests on the railway verge. Laying the granite and limestone ballast, so essential to the structure of the track bed, has in effect spread trails throughout the land, some leading from the coasts to the interior. Plants that live on shingle beaches have caught the train and travelled inland where they find the hot, dry stones of the ballast just like home. Once real shingle was used for this job. Swindon in summer glows with biting stone crop or wall pepper, a succulent plant that retains moisture by opening its breathing pores only at night, a perfect system for this railway desert. Snowford near Leamington Spa is about as far from the coast as it's possible to be and yet here has come Danish scurvy grass. Once its leaves were eaten by sailors as a protection against scurvy. It thrives on the shingle of this false shore. Close by, there's dark green mouse-eared chickweed, rarely found away from the sea, but this track record proves it to be a great railway traveller. <laughs> Carried in carriages, caught on wheels, picked up by passengers or simply swept along by the turbulent slipstream, plants and their seeds have been crossing the country with the help of trains.
With each plant producing some 80,000 fluffy seeds, Rose Bay Willow Herb might well have been designed for railways. In Yorkshire, they call it the railway lily. Another name, fireweed, betrays its preference for colonizing burnt ground. It's a plant that burgeoned in the age of steam. Steam trains suited this ragwort from Sicily. Escaping from the Oxford Botanic Garden in the 18th century, it reached the ash ballast of the Great Western Railway in 1879, a good substitute for the volcanic soils of its home. Its seeds parachuted into and after trains, and slowly, the Oxford ragwort, as it became known, spread along the lines to become, by the 1920s, a very common plant. Now it's becoming rare on the railway. The spray trains have seen to that. But railways are a place of change. They can flourish or decline, both biologically and politically. In the 1960s, the steam trains died though, unlike the dinosaurs, they were not to become extinct. Branch lines vanished, ruthlessly culled by Dr. Beeching's axe. His famous official report brought about a painful revolution, but one designed to initiate a new age of the train. The arguments still echo round the walls, but in the opinion of some, Beeching was the greatest railway man since Brunel. In the absence of the length men, abandoned lines began to drown in a sea of vegetation. The animals and plants went on enjoying the seclusion of this private wilderness, but released from the control of scythe and hoe and spray, the tracks and verges overgrew, racing towards a natural cover of young woodland. The network was cut by half. But what was to happen to the tatters of disused railway land? They presented an unfamiliar problem. Here was unique land, but how could it be used? <laughs> One answer lay in making what had been an exclusive world more accessible. The trains were gone, and people could now see and touch the wealth of plants and animals in safety. The apparently awkward shape of these newfound lands in fact led to competition for their use. Ironically, only a few sections of railway were turned into roadway, one of the competitors that had forced the beaching cuts. This remains recognizably a railway route by virtue of its bridges and the nature of its slopes, cuttings and embankments that bear the rich stamp of a century or more of growth. As footpaths, some branch lines wear the look of Roman roads. Level and direct, they also have appeal for cyclists and as quiet bridleways. At night, the urban fox still commutes along them, but any shy badgers that might have enjoyed the railway's protection would find this too public a highway now.
Perhaps it's a sidetrack of that passion we have for more ancient ruins that entices us back onto the artefacts of a former age of rail. This railway remnant of old Dorset still flickers with butterflies, marbled whites and others, busy with the valerian and the purple toad flax. On some railway paths, you can now walk deep into country once quite difficult to approach on foot. In the heart of Derbyshire, this glorious winding dale of the Wye could formerly be followed only by train. Some disused railway cuttings, even in areas of outstanding natural beauty, have been used as convenient refuse dumps. In 1980, this cutting at Donyat in Somerset was threatened with such use. But local enthusiasts fought for its future as a nature reserve. Its oak-lined slopes, they argued, are home to 182 plants, 56 birds and 25 kinds of butterfly. And now there are ponds rich in aquatic life where the track once ran. Their battle took seven years to win. As with an active railway, careful management of this cutting will always be needed to keep its diversity of life. Only recently has this marsh at Doxey near Stafford ceased to belong to British Rail. Generously, they gave it to the local naturalist trust. Now they care for the bitterns and spotted crakes that can sometimes be seen by commuters to crew. Along the operational routes, there remains land of great biological importance. It now adds up to about half the size of a national park like Dartmoor, but it still contains two-thirds of our native wild flowers. British Rail is managing both a railway and the longest nature reserve in the world. The success of the urban fox owes much to its commuting along the cuttings. The scrub must hide dens by the thousand around our cities. Not all foxes are quite as cheeky as this vixen. The commuters that catch a glimpse of her often leave titbits with the station staff. Foxy carries them back to her cubs and somehow she seems aware of the need to avoid the live electric rail. And there's a wildlife spectacular every winter evening at Bristol's Temple Mead station. Right on time, starlings arrive from all directions and perform their bedtime ballet. They're not officially popular in the station, but as they dive into their roost under the railway bridge, they're a sight worth looking out for, even if you have to catch a later train. Much of what's known about the natural history of this forbidden land has come from a recent investigation. In 1977, a team of scientists set out to make an independent survey of the railway's plants and animals for the Nature Conservancy Council. The survey was in response to concern expressed in Parliament some years earlier about the future of these verges. Chemical sprays had largely replaced the length men and it was feared this change would damage what might be a special landscape. Over five years the team examined hundreds of cuttings and embankments. At each place they count the different plants. The numbers within this metal frame or quadrat indicate how many are on the whole slope. 
the job calls for a good botanical eye. The picnic thistle is an easy start. But spotting surprises like basil thyme, or picking out the flowers and fruit of black medic, as well as all the other plants packed into this one patch, takes even an expert time. Into the computer go hop trefoil, eyebright, wild carrot, eggs and bacon, and dozens more, all coded for their proper Latin names. And out has come a report to which British Rail has begun to respond in the way it looks after its land. 181 sites have already been recognised as being of outstanding biological interest. And several are really quite special. Only an imaginary journey would take a traveller past them all. It could start in Cornwall. Close to the docks, Falmouth Station became home to several plants from overseas. It's a pleasantly green oasis on this urban peninsula. Most of the dockside lines have gone. Only the single track to Truro remains. Passengers waiting for the train have spread before them more than the railwayman's potted plants. The balmy southern climate suits the Monterey pines from California. The palm trees and bamboo lend a tropical flavour. Below the budlia, common toad flax brightens the undergrowth of bramble and ivy. But there's another very rare toad flax here that has put this station on the survey map. In only six other places is this prostrate toad flax found, and three of those are by other railway lines. cover here for nesting birds and the ubiquitous budlia draws many kinds of butterfly. And so we're off on our botanical mystery tour. Eastwards towards Devon through a very narrow corridor, a sliver of Cornish moorland. Where the track strides over the liner estuary, the viaduct stands in its own salt marsh. By slowing the current, the piers may have provided sufficient protection to allow the marsh to develop. The lineside fences march down to the water, marking an unusual tidal railway enclosure. It's confluent with a tiny woodland of oak and ash, rooted on the embankment of Slate Scree. Out of a cutting, over the river, and on. Through the landscape to vanish under a distant hill. Now, in our roundabout way, through Oxfordshire, and a cutting in which a small woodland of ash trees crowns a valued limestone grassland. Stone walls shore up the steepest part, but beside them, amongst the grasses, are colours that can catch the traveller's eye. The viper's bugloss is plundered for its nectar. And close by, the very rare meadow clary has found a refuge. It's almost extinct in Britain, and that makes this a very special place. It's not only naturalists that want this grassland kept in trim. The railway engineers want it too, though for reasons of safety. So between them, that ought to ensure that rarities are not choked out. Pyramidal orchids grace these slopes, 
and there's broom rape, wild licorice, and harebells too. Northwards to Wales, and at Singret, the line is flanked by trees that shelter many woodland plants. In May, these woods are pungent with wild garlic, ramsons, like snow in springtime. to Derbyshire and limestone country. Today, only quarry trains ply what's left of the line that runs through Wydale. Once there was a busy junction here, but now that the lines have gone, the trees on the left have hidden the tiny halt. But its platform is still there, and in spring it blossoms, even with orchids. These wet, north-facing walls make Wydale special. The rare green spleenwort finds these cuttings a satisfactory home. It's never been common, as there are few natural rock faces like this. At Meathop, on the northern edge of Morecambe Bay, the sweep of this embankment embraces a huge salt marsh and protects it from the farms on the landward side. Possibly the stone used to build the embankment came from this quarry, itself a sheltered wildlife refuge. The line passes by following the level course of this Cumbrian coast. Like so many of our coastal railways, it forms a barrier that gives privacy to shorebirds and plants. Through formidable pavements of Pennine limestone, the last major line to be built with pick and shovel alone carves a majestic path from Settle to Carlisle. At Gorba, it runs hard by a quarry, part of which is an official nature reserve. But the land inside the railway fence is just as rich with centaury, thyme, eyebright, harebells and frog orchids. In places, the railway land meets the quarry face. And from here, the locally abundant bird's eye primroses have advanced close to the line. And there's the curious adder's tongue fern jutting from the rich, wet, stony turf. The future of this spectacular line has been in question, but although it's expensive to maintain, it may stay operational. So, this floral jewel at Gorba may continue to enjoy the protection of the railway fence. And so, into Scotland, welcomed by a carpet of wood vetch dressing the slopes of the unspoiled coastline at Burnmouth, on Britain's northeastern shoulder. The journey approaches its end, steam hauled by British Rail, moving at a pace that allows the natural beauty on and off the railway to be drunk in at leisure. Close to the track, 
Within the confines of the fences, there's a ribbon of Scotland that's quite special. Corridors cut through the granite, festooned with ferns and mosses, to the driver almost a jungle path, with a luxuriance reflecting the relatively warm climate of this southern highland coast. At Beesdale, a brief pause by a clear mountain spring, watering an abundance of liverworts and mosses. Though just one step from the line, there's as keen a sense of the wild here as in the remotest glen, and probably an older, richer railway flower garden. Our journey to Malague is almost done. In the words of the poet W.H. Auden, all Scotland waits for her. In the dark glens beside the pale green sea lochs, men long for news. There's romance in railways, as well as the business of travel. But the age of steam also created what's proved to be an essential refuge for wild plants and animals. And in future, we may be able to do more than gaze out of the window at the lineside verges. We could find ourselves helping to look after them. British Rail and groups of naturalists are already seeking ways of working together. The needs of the railway could match the needs of wildlife. Life is still there, where only the ghost of Auden's night mail thunders past cotton grass and moorland boulder, shoveling white steam over her shoulder, snorting noisily as she passes silent miles of wind-bent grasses. Birds turn their heads as she approaches, stare from the bushes at her blank-faced coaches. Cheap dogs cannot turn her course, they slumber on with paws across. In the farm she passes, no one wakes, but a jug in a bedroom gently shakes. St. Austin, Truro, Red Ruth, Camborne, Hale. Platform. 1600 hours departure for Swan. 